Amen. 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 Um, um, praise God. Praise God. Good to see everyone. Um, we are in week two of. <coughs> sorry. Um, we are in week two of a series called "Fully Known and Fully Loved," and and um, what we are really doing over the next four weeks is really navigating what is the implications of the gospel. If the gospel is true, what does that apply to us, and how do we live out this this truth? Um, last week we covered this concept to be known, and um, what the writer says is that um, we are known by God. Like everything, every aspect of shame, every aspect of guilt, every aspect of sin, God knows it to the fullest of ten, extent that some people might not know. Even you might not know because God searches your heart. But he knows to the fullest extent. And in that full extent, he's able to fully love you. This is the premise of the gospel is that the God that knows you completely, that there's no reason for there to be shame in your life in any capacity because he knows it all. This is why the gospel says this. He says, I am, I am not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel removes that shame of someone not knowing something or I have to hide. We talked about that in, in um, Genesis of how when sin comes, sin always calls you to hide. But we're going to talk about a different type of hiding here. We're going to talk about this idea of what happens when the gospel comes and we hide our lives in Christ, when we hide our identities in Christ, when we put on Christ fully, and what does that play out? So today we're going to deal with this concept, to know love is to show love, right? This can be true in many theological things outside of love. It could be to know grace is to show grace, right? And it's, and it's really this concept of, how are we knowing the love that God has given us, and how is that being reflected in our lives? So I want to pray, then after that, we're going to jump into John 13, verse 34. But I'm going to pray, then after that, we're going to jump right into this. Um, continue to pray for Pastor Sutton. He had a, he had a rough night last night. Um, um, so let's just be praying for him and his, and his sugar, and that his pain in his body will all... Um, go down so he can feel better, so he can join us back at church. So let us just keep him in our prayers as we're praying. All right? Amen. Let's go to the throne. Heavenly Father, God, you are a good and gracious God. Your love is amazing. God, we come here with our hearts open, God, ready to receive what your word says so that we can know you better, God, and God, that because you have already known us. God, I ask you, pray, God, that today, that as we're going through the, the scripture, that the word of the, of the text search our hearts, challenge us, call us to rise up to what you have called us to become. And God, ultimately, God, that the glory of God might be seen in our lives, not for us, so that man might see our good works and glorify the Father. So, God, I ask you, pray, God, that as we're going through the text, God, that you help someone today, God, today, God, to know love and to show love. So, God, I pray that in this moment that you decrease me. Let them not see me nor hear me all hear and feel in your love. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and get going. Let's go ahead and get that. Yeah. I like John uh, 13, uh, 34, because we all talked about um, when the lawyer came and he tested Jesus, he said, what are the greatest commandments? And um, Jesus said, um, there's two great commandments. Um, one is to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, to give it all, right? And he said, the second is like the first, to love thy neighbor as thyself. And all of the law hangs on these two commandments. And um, but in John 13, he does something different. So we got those two. We mastered those, those two commandments. He says, if you got those two commandments, you're pretty good. You, you got 100% of the law pretty much covered. Then he gets to John 13. And this is what he says. He says, a new commandment I give you. A new commandment? What's the new commandment? That you love one another. And guess what? That sounds... Similar to the second commandment that he gave, 
but he's going to modify it in a way that challenges us as believers. And this is how he's modified it. He says, love one another just as I love you. You also are to love one another. This is, this is the critical thing here, right? Because if you do not know the love of Christ, you cannot feel this command. There's no way I can love you as Christ loved me if I do not know how he loves me. There's no way you can feel this thing. So there's a knowledge of knowing Christ is important in order for you to walk in the knowledge of God. We're going to unpack this a lot more. But he said, when you understand the love of Christ, and that love of Christ is in your heart, and you're showing that to all people, he said this, by this all people would know that you are my disciple. See, there's something that turns transcendent. God knows me. He loves me. I know the love. I show the love, and people know God. This is a pattern that is part of the gospel is that uh, many times people think evangelism is simply them on the soapbox yelling at people. But the greatest form of evangelism is, is to show God. We're going to unpack this a lot more today, but that's the greatest form of evangelism is to show God in that light that they have never seen. John chapter 1 starts with that idea. He said, in the, in the light of man, was a man, man. The goal is to show people that light. So what happens, he says, by this, all people would know that you are my disciple if you love one another. This is a critical thing because how can you say that you know something when you don't know the God that gives love? So the question is, what is this love that God is talking about? I think the writer does an excellent job of how he set this up, especially Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. And we covered this a little bit last week, but I, um, I really like this. Uh, Paul is praying to the church at Ephesus, and he says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you strength with power through, the spirit, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. How do I get this love? I have to believe. I mean, we're going to un really unpack this. Right? right the only way I can accept that God loves me right now, I have to have faith. I have to believe it. I have to believe it. Because if you don't believe it, you will instantly struggle with the concept that he loves you. This is why last week we looked at 1 John when he said, if your heart condemns you, God is greater. This is a, it's a battle of you seeing yourself as loved and accepted. Because believe it or not, if you don't have faith, the devil will always whisper what you did. He will always bring up your past. He will always bring up your weakness. This is why Paul says, the, the good that I want to do, I cannot do. But the good that I know I should do, I can't do. Then he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body? He said, blessed be God, Jesus Christ, the Lord, who saves us, the deliverer. It's when Christ comes in, he's the justifier. He's the one that says, you're loved. I love you just like that. As long as your heart is totally committed and, and rooted in faith, and you believe it, I could bring you to a whole new life. This is the beauty of the gospel. So what Paul is praying that, man, you need Christ to be living in your heart through faith. Why? This is the key. We just talked about what Jesus just commanded us, right? I have to love people as Christ loved me, but how do I do that? Christ first got to be living in your heart. Amen. Why? That you being rooted and grounded and love. Christ got to be so rooted and grounded in everything you do. 
everything that you think about, every word that comes out of your mouth, has to have some indignation of love in it. Amen. Why? Because Christ is in your heart. The goal is to have Christ in your heart and that you be rooted and grounded in love. Then he goes in verse 18, he, and he continued to unpack this. He said, may have strength to comprehend with all saints. Right? Not only do I need to love it, but I need to have a, be able to comprehend and get along with you. Because the love of Christ has to be shown, not just understood. We're going to, we're going to talk about this understanding in a few minutes, but it has to be shown. So what he's saying is that people are going to push your buttons. How do we know? He said this. He said, what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth? What he does is that he takes three dimensions and he put it in four-dimensional space. And he said, people are going to stretch you beyond your capability. You're going to think people are going to take you to the widest distance that they can, to the highest heights, to the lowest depths. People are hard to love. Believe it or not, Christ knows this more than anything. People are hard-headed. He knows more than anything. You can give them your all, and they still reject you. Christ knows this more than anything. So what he's saying is that you're going to need to have strength to be able to do this. You're going to be able to need to have strength when you have to love in the capacity when it doesn't make sense. You got to be able to comprehend it. How do I comprehend it? Through Christ, living in your heart, rooted and grounded in love. Love makes everything make sense. We're going to unpack this. It's going, going to all come together at the end. But people, he says, I need you to be able to comprehend this love with people. Then he goes in verse 19, he says this. Why? And to know the love of Christ. When I'm comprehending with people, I'm, not only am I interacting with them and showing love, but I'm learning about God's love more. So much that sometimes the love in Christ that's in my heart has been poured out and I'm doing it and it makes no sense. This is why he said to know the love of God in Christ that surpasses knowledge. Sometimes you got to love when it doesn't make sense. Why? Because something compels you in your heart to pour out and to give. When you sit there, you reflect on the love of God that when you were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He showed this love towards us that when I was breaking down and doing the wrong thing, Christ gave himself as a propitiation for my sin. This is the call of the gospel is that we get an opportunity to walk in this love to declare this love that this world do not know. He says that when you do this, when I'm loving like this, when I'm, when I'm living like this, he says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So once you start loving with God, you start to be full. You start to feel him more. Sense him more. Because that's the heart of God is that he wants to get you to have knowledge of him in a way that you can't even comprehend. That's intimacy. That's the intimacy and relationship. It's knowing God beyond your own ability to comprehend. But what happens, Justin, because we all go to church and every church you go to, you don't feel love. Every preacher you hear, it doesn't sound like love. How do I navigate that? Paul does this great thing, and he says, there are some people that say they know, but they don't know. They're acting like they know because they have facts, they have words to say, but how do I know that you know God? 
by love. This is what Jesus said. So obviously, whenever you're interacting with people who don't know, they don't know God. He says this. Paul talking about food, but he wanna, you, you want to see where we're going to go with this. He says this. Now concerning food up to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. So everybody knows something. Everybody know the buzz. Everyone know the scoop. As the, the generation say, everyone has the tea. But sometimes you knowing so much, it doesn't produce love. It produces what he said, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Something, this is why you can go to a church and you feel like they're just speaking down on you. Because they have this knowledge. they like, I got this degree from this Bible college, and they talk down to people. When the, the purpose of the gospel is to build up. To actually find the lost who is broken and laying down and to restore them back to their feet. To the right place. To redeem. That's the concept of redemption is to when something is broken, you put it back to value. Only love can do that. Not knowledge. So on Sunday, these are not intellectual exercises of, of us just going through words and talking, but it's the Chasing of God's heart to know love and to know his heart. He says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. He goes in, in, in verse 2, he says, if anyone imagine that he knows something, he imagine it. He made it up in his head. People think they know more about God than they actually know. He said, if anyone imagines that they know something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. This is what he's saying. There's people that think they master God because they understand theology, they understand certain concepts. They've been in church all their life. And they think, they, not only do they think it, they imagine it. They have made this story of what I'm doing and how I live and how I'm acting makes me closer to God. This is why we have religious people in churches. Because when I cross off the list and I have never messed up and I don't do those things and I don't do this thing and they act better than people and they, and they tear down versus build up. What he's saying is that some people imagine that they know something. They actually act like they know God. And he does not yet know as he ought to know. Man, have you ever met someone that acts like they know somebody and they really don't know him? Act like they, they, they cool with someone and they really not cool with that person? This is what he's talking about. We have people that do that with God. They come in here, they're like, man, I know God. I know how you know God? Oh, man, you know, I read the Bible, I do this, and this, this, this. But what he's arrogant in, in this moment is if you don't know him by his love, you don't know him at all. Why? This is why he said in verse 3, he said, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. See, see, there's impossible for you to say you know God and you don't know his love. That you don't have the capacity to show his love. How is that happening? And many times we separate our knowledge of God and our ability to love God. And, and we separate that from our ability to love people. And so we're navigating in life, talking about, oh man, you know, I go to church. I do this and this and this. But when God says, do you love me? Keep my commandments. We, uh, I, don't, I don't really want to do all of that. Then sometimes we say, I do all of that, but I just can't stand people. How? This is what he's painting in the picture is that when you understand love and your heart is fully surrendered. I think, I think sometimes that's critical that your heart has to be fully surrendered. 
that when God tells you to love, you love. When God tells you to go, you go. Listen here. There's a book in the Old Testament by this, this prophet named Jonah. And Jonah, if you don't know, it's a fish in the story and all that stuff. But the gist of the story is this. God says, Jonah, you say you love me. Go to these people. And he say, I don't want to do that. Why? Because I don't like those people. I love you, but I don't like these people. And what God is doing is that he's challenging the heart. He's saying, how can you love me but don't love the things I want to love? It's almost like someone saying, I love you, but everything you do or everything you like, I hate. How is it possible to be in a relationship with God? So, so what he does with Jonah is that he shows us this long, drawn-out story. That so much that Jonah was willing to commit suicide versus doing what God told him to do because of what God loved. He was like, throw me over the boat. And as they threw him over the boat, the love of God saved him with a whale. See, no one sees it like that. Everyone sees he just got swallowed by a whale. But if he was, had hit that water in that storm, he probably would have not lived. So God Capture him with love. Saved him. Even in his disobedience. He saves him. He preserves him. And in the, the fish stomach, he repents. He comes to him and says, man, some of us are in real experiences. What a real experience. Everything in my life is passing me by, but I feel like I'm stuck in the same situation. And I don't understand it. And I'm saying, God, I love you, but, but I don't understand. Because I have not fully fell in love with the things that God loves. This is the beautiful part about this. He repents. And the, and the fish spits him on the sea. And he goes and he does what God have told him to do. And he did it. But when the people got saved, he got upset again. He started moping again. He got sad again. See, everyone talk, ends the story there, but what I like about the book of Jonah is how the book of Jonah ends. He gets to a place and the sun is burning him. It's cooking him and he's, he's irritated. Talking about the love of God. And God's grace and mercy overnight grows a tree for shade for him. And he's like, oh, man, I love this shade. It's so amazing. It's so good. And when he wakes up the next day, the tree is dead. And Jonah is so upset over the tree and the loss of the tree. And God says, how can you have so much passion for a tree that you just had for a day versus a whole nation that is lost? See, this is why God changed our hearts. He said, how can you have so much passion for the blessings that only bless you? But you have no love for those who are lost. The things that I love. The things that break my heart. This is what he said. Sometimes people act like they know something, but we know what you know based on what you do. We know what you know based on what you do. This is why James said it like this. He said, People say they got faith. You show me your faith without works. I'm going to show you my faith by my works. Because when I believe love, when I believe God, I act as such throughout my life. And this is what James was talking about. People come to church praying for you and send them off hungry. As they sit there, eat they Big Mac. I'm praying for you. God will, God will deliver you. Right? And, and the challenge of it is that he's saying to himself is that how can you say you love God and you see that and you say, I have the means to help. 
but I'm so worried about preserving myself. I have the means to make it happen, but I'm so worried about keeping what's mine. Do you know the love of God? When you know the love of God and, it is, and it's rooted and grounded and it's, it's consecrated in faith, you don't mind releasing the love because you know who your source is. You actually know where you're going to get it back at. You like know whose you belong to. This is why he says this. If anyone loves God, he's known by God. Are you confident that God knows you? This is why last week was so critical, that you have to be confident that he knows me. And he loves me as I am. This is the ideal of how do we get to a place where we are loving God and, and finding our life for God. Let's look at Colossus 3, 2. He said this, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things on earth. Many times, in churches, all we talk about is earthly things. A lot of sermons and a lot of preachers talk about the blessings of God. And, and, and listen here, I'm not against the blessings of God. I want the blessings of God. But if that's your only motive, you would never be able to set your mind to the things of above. The godly things. His, the, the same prayer that Christ prayed, not my will be done, but your will be done, on earth, as it is in heaven. I can't say I want to ask heaven on earth if I don't even know what heaven is. I don't even know what your purpose is. I don't even know what your will is. I don't know what your heart is. So our focus first is of a, things of above. God, how do you look at this situation? How do your heart break for the loss? How do you see people who are in these type of situations so that you can fill my heart in a way, in the capacity that I can reflect that love here? So we have to set our minds on things that are above, not the things on earth. Why? 33, uh, verse, chapter 3, verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. This is why we get baptized, right? And I, and, I, and, I, and I actually think sometimes we actually miss this, but when you baptize, what you're saying is that, God, I love you, and I want to believe this, and I want to put my hope in this. I want to put my life in this. So you die with Christ. And the life that comes up is Christ. Your life is hidden. It's gone. It's no longer what it used to be. And there's a challenging concept here because there's behaviors and desires that still irking in your heart. This is why Paul writes Romans 7. Who shall deliver me? It's the dependency on Christ on everything that we do. By Christ, our real life is hidden. Everything, our identity, our values, our dreams, our hope is hidden with Christ in God. So this is why we are looking to the heavens and hoping for God is verse 4. He said this, when Christ, who is your life? See, a lot of us and, and many believers there was a season where I was in this, too, is that Christ is part of our life, but he is not our life. He's a, he's a component of our lives, but he's not my life. I don't live for Christ. There was a season I wouldn't live for I'm like, yeah, I go to church, yeah, I do this, I did this, this, but I'm living to be a banker, or I'm, I'm living to do this in life. I'm living this, but Christ is your life. This is why the writer says, whatever you eat or drink, you do it for the glory of God. Because everything I do, my life is Christ. So he said, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, there are some things about me that I'm not fully going to understand until Christ comes back. 
Man, listen, listen, listen here. Right. There's some tears that I have cried and heart aches that was broken. And I asked the question, why, God? Why is this happening in my life? I'm not going to know until he come back. Because he is my life, and when he come back, it all going to make sense. And I'm going to be able to glorify God forever and ever. It's this ideal is that my heart is being poured into him, that I'm putting myself all into him, knowing that when he re- comes back, The one that I love. The one who have placed me in this earth will make all things new. He then goes on, we're going to look at John, First John, because what the writer is, I'm not trying to build this ideal now, is that if you understand this, there should start being confidence to start building up. He says this, now little children, abide in him. Who he's talking about? Christ. John talking to him, he said, hey, Little children, I, I, I actually love the language of John in this letter because he talks to him with the, the language of children and beloved. Because he's trying to articulate, who do you belong to? Who is your father? He said, you're loved. You're his children. He said, now little children, abide in him. So that when he appears... We may have confidence, right? This is the beautiful thing, right? We just talked about when he appeared, we're going to see our life. But when he appeared, we're going to be like, yes, he's back. Versus the world who's going to be frightened. Because the Bible says he's going to come with fire in his eyes. On a horse. With a tattoo on his thigh. Saying Christ is Lord of Lords. And he's going to come raging in. And we're going to be champion for him. Yes. While the world is trembling for him. Yes. This is how God is going to return. This is how we're going to act. It's that our confidence is going to be in this love. You might say, where you get that from? Give me some time. I'm building. We're going to get there. We have this confidence in this love. Where? Listen here. And not shrinking from him in shame at his coming. How do I know I have encountered the true amount of love of God? I have no shame in my life. Listen here. I would say, the gospel makes you not ashamed. If there's shame still in your life, you have not fully encountered the gospel. You have not fully encountered the gospel. This is why when people talk about their past in a light that you be like, what? You ain't ashamed of that? I'm not ashamed because I know what he delivered me from. And I know that if he have not came to deliver me, where I will be. So there's no shame in how I communicate and articulate who I am. Because I know he fully know me. He fully accepted me and he fully loved me to bring me to this point. So we don't shrink back. When, when Christ comes, we're not scared. We're not hiding. This is supposed to give you the picture, the picture of Genesis. That when God comes in the garden and he says, Adam, where are thou? Adam has shrunk back in shame. He said, where you at? I come every day. Day at the same time to be with you. Why are you hiding? Because sin has entered his heart. But when the gospel has re enter our hearts, when he comes and he says, Justin, where are you? I'm going to say, Here am I. I'm here. Just as you have designed me to be. There's no shame. That's the power of the gospel. He goes on in verse 29 and he says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. How do I know I'm loved? How do I know I'm righteous? Is that I start to practice it because I start to reflect who he is. I start to think how he is. I start to speak how he is. I start to live in my life as 
He is because I've been born of him. I've been baptized. I've been risen up. And my desires are no longer my own, but it's chasing something new. He goes in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given us. You have to understand the love. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that they did not know him. See, there's a love that God is really loving that the world cannot comprehend. Why? Because they do not know God. And godly people know the love of God. Like, listen here. When you encounter the love of God, you're not going to be fooled by no counterfeits. You're going to be like, that ain't God. How do you know? I know. Because I have studied the real thing. Like, like he got the most beautiful thing about this is that um, when people are in the, um, the treasury, he go to the U.S. Treasury, and they're, and they're studying to detect counterfeit bills, right? They don't study counterfeits. They study the real thing intensely. So when a counterfeit comes, they say, I know that's not real. Well, how do you know it's not real? Because I'm so entangled with the realness that no one can fool me with the fake. This is what he's saying. When you are so entangled with God, no one can fool you with the fake. No one can fool you with fake love. No one can fool you with lust. No one can fool you with manipulation. Because I know what love looks like and I know what love feels because he first loved me. He says this in verse 2. Beloved, why? You're the children of God, but not only are you a child of God, you are beloved. We are now God's children now. Listen here. I, 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 I always want to make this point whenever I'm preaching, is that everyone not God's children. I think, I think the world has took a message and perverted it. We're all God's children. No, we're not. But when I'm in Christ and I'm living for Christ and I hear my life in Christ, I'm now a child of God. And because I'm a child of God, I'm beloved. Because we are the child of God's now. That we will be, what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. This is the beautiful part about it. I'm a child of God. And, and thank you, Holy Spirit. We're living in a world that people are trying to live their full potential on this earth. And you're not going to live your full potential until Christ comes back. Like, you understand? That everything that you have, all your thrill, is going to to come back. You, some of those dreams and those desires only going to be fulfilled in Christ. This is our goal is that we love God and we say, God, show me what I need to be. Teach me how to love myself. Teach me how to become the person that you have called me to be. Teach me how to hide my life in you. Teach me how to know your love. But not only that, God, teach me how to show it. Give me the strength to show it. When I'm tired, teach me how to show it. When I'm irritated, teach me how to show it. When I'm discouraged, because sometimes we think it's situational that if you're feeling good that you only got to do it, but not nah, in season and out of season. When you feel it and when you don't, you have to do it. Teach me how to love. How? How, Christ? Teach me how you was on the cross. And you're looking at them and you're telling them, forgive them. For they know not what they do. How you praying for people while you're on the cross? How you on the cross and you're looking at your mama and saying, Mama and John, I care for y'all so much. I need to help y'all situations. When you came and helped your, come on now. There's a love. 
that God wants you to understand. There's a love that goes beyond who you are. And you're not fully going to really understand that until you come back and you see him. You're going to say, that's how I am? I'm God. This is how you designed me? You're going to see the beauty of Christ. And everything that you are is going to ignite. Why is this critical? Let's look at what he said in John chapter 4. And we're almost done. John chapter 4, verse 7. He says this, beloved. Why is this important? You're loved. And sometimes we live our lives like we're, we don't know that we're loved. Beloved. He says this countless times in First John. Beloved, beloved, beloved. Why? That's a title that you have. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? People in the church use the title saints. Praise the Lord, saint. We can use the title beloved. I'm his beloved. And this is the commandment that he's going to do. He said, beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Listen here. This is critical here, right? Because I'm love, I can show love. Because I know love, I can show love. For love is from God. So if I don't know love, I don't know God. He's going to get to that in a few minutes, but we're going to get to it. For love is from God. The love that he's requiring from me comes from God. That, and whoever love has been born of God, I can only love to the capacity if my life is hidden in Christ. I can't, listen here, if your life is not hidden in Christ, you will be frustrated trying to do this because you don't have the capacity. This is why Paul prayed the prayer, that Christ be rooted and grounded in your heart, that you may be strengthened in your inner man to be able to have the capacity to be able to comprehend. Because when he loves and I'm born of Christ and I'm living in Christ and Christ living in me, I can do the impossible. I can do the things that surpass my understanding. Because it's not coming from me, it's coming from God. So we know that you've been born of God, but you also know God. How do we know you know God? Because the only way you're doing this is that Christ is rooted and grounded in your heart through faith. So we know Christ is in your heart because you're able to love. But what happens if you don't? Let's see this in verse 8. He says, anyone who does not love does not know God. Period. Why? Because God is love. How are you not pouring out the thing that's supposed to be in your heart? How? 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 And there are seasons. Listen here. Listen here. There are seasons in our lives where we literally have to open up our hearts and say, God, I need you to heal what's broken. I need you to heal what's broken. Because when I think about what that person did to me, I'm going to be transparent. Saying, what that writer and son said, I want to pick up and hit him in the head with a rock. Right? Right? You know what I'm saying? It's still there. And God, I need you to love me in a way that you can heal my heart. Amen. I need you to heal it so that I can give it. Listen here. You cannot give what you do not have. You can't. If I come to you and I say, give me a million dollars, I don't care how much you desire to give it to me. But if you don't got it in your account, you can't give it. Right? So, I, God, I need you to fill me up. This is why the writer said, so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. I need you to fill my heart to a capacity that I can give it. And when I give it, listen here, I'm still not lacking anything. Because once I give it, you fill it back up. That's the gospel. That's the beauty of the gospel. That his promise is that you will lack nothing in him. He says this in verse 9. We, we, we almost done. We, we, we wrap this up. He says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. How? That God sent his only son 
into the world so that we might live through him. Christ came so that we can live this life. This is how God says love. So God so loved the world, he gave it on his begotten son. That whoever should believe should have everlasting life. Right? This is the, 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 the heart of God. He's saying, I want you to live this life. Because I sent my son. I myself became flesh. Came to the earth in a baby. Lived for 33 years. Died under Pontius Pilate. Rose on the third day with all power and all authorities and heaven and earth given to him so that you might be able to live through him. Our heart is to live through God. He said this in verse 10. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our, for our sins. This is what he's saying. He said, you didn't come looking for God. He came looking for you. Why? We actually see him in Romans that he says, no one looks for God. But God came looking for you. He chased you down. He kept call you. Hey, you over there. Man in your business. Trying to go to work. Come over here. I'm going to love on you, right? This is, this is the imagery that it happened. That he called you when you were just doing your own thing. Out of all the people around, he's pointing you out. He says, hey, I got, some, I got a gift for you. You weren't even looking for the gift. He said, I got the gift for you. I got something that's going to free you up and make you. The only question you can ask is, why me, God? Out of all these people, why are you loving me like this? But he said, because we, listen here. He says, when I look at you, I see me. And that's attractive. That's what I want. Listen here. God would have not called you if you're not able to live this life. He would have not called you. So he died for your sin. In verse 11, he said this, Beloved, why? Why did he say this again? Because sometimes we struggle with knowing that we're fully loved by God. Beloved, if God so love us, we also ought to love one another. I can't love one another if I don't love. Understand God loves me. He says this, verse 12. No one has ever seen God. And if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfect in us. We want to talk about the maturity of love. Verse, he actually then goes on, talks, talks about it in verse 15. He says, whoever confessed that Christ Jesus is the son of God abides in him and he and God, right? This is the beautiful part, right? That God abides in him and he and God. This is a picture of my life hidden in Christ but Christ living in my heart. I can only say Christ is God if the work of love is working in my heart and believe it. I can only do it if I believe it. So, if this is true, you go to verse 16. And this is it. 16 and 17 is it. He says this. So that we have come to know and to believe that love that God has for us. God is love. You see this statement again. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. How do we know that your life is hidden in Christ, you love him. How do we know that Christ is rooted and grounded in your heart? You love him. And this is, and when you are loving, it builds confidence. When you are being matured in God and you know you're doing what God has called you to do and you're loving 
beyond your capacity and beyond your understanding, you just doing what you say the word of God there, it builds perfect love in us. He says this in verse 17, by this love perfect with us. It is perfected with us. When we're living our lives like this, the love of God is being better and better and growing and growing so much so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. How do I know I'm saved? Because of how I love. See, I don't, look, listen, listen. Some people know they saved because they be like, because I go to church, because I'm doing this, I'm doing this. this, this, this. How do you know that you love and God is with you? Because how I love. Because I love like God, and I understand his love, and I'm living the love. And I have confidence that when he come back, I'm going to be celebrating when he appears. Because everything that I am, my life is hidden in here, and I'm going to see myself as I should be. Because as he is so, also we in the world. Verse 18, he says, there is no fear and love. No fear and love. What you're afraid of? The God love haven't overcome it yet. Man, God, I'm afraid that if I put myself out there, they're going to reject me. Why? Why? Because it's going to hurt. Because that's really what I want. I like want them to accept me. Why do you want them to accept you when you've already been accepted? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Why do you want their approval when God has already approved you? He's challenging your heart. Where's the fear coming from? He said, there is no fear in this love, but perfect love casts out this fear. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment, a consequence. And whoever fear has not been perfect in love. Listen here. There's moments in my, in my life where the anxiety rises up inside of me. And I feel like I'm going to lose it all. It's all going to fall apart. And I start getting nervous. Oh, God, it's going to fall apart. Like, and God says, why do you think you hold it together? When I hold the whole world together in my hand. I hold your life in my hand. Why do you feel that it's going to fall apart? Where's this fear coming from? Because deeply in my heart, I feel like, but maybe what if God don't want to do it for me right now in this season? Maybe God was like, man, Jeff, I gave Justin too much. I don't want to give him no more. These are the thoughts that we have, but we don't say it, but it rises up in anxiety. Why? Because if I believe he's my father, and I am his and he is mine. And there's a love that he has for me that he calls me his child. And he's a good, good father. That he's going to make sure all things are working together for those who love God. And call to his purpose. Where is this coming from? Love had not been perfect yet. And that's an area that I need to grow in love. God, I need you to love me better. I need you to come and rescue my heart. Because it's been drifting. And I hear people saying stuff, and I'm believing it, and my heart is drifting. So God, I need you to come rescue my heart. I thought I surrendered it, but in this moment, I'm realizing there were some compartments in my life that I had I kept away from you. And I need you to come back. I need you to live in my heart. I need you to be my God. And I'm going to be your child. Because we love you. Because you, listen here, I, I love you. Why? Verse 19. We love because he first loved us. There's times where I feel like, God, I can't do it. And he said, D -d -d I love you, Justin. I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm with you. I love you. And I say, oh, man, 
I love you too, God. Thank you for looking in me and seeing things in me that I can't see in myself that motivates me to do the things that I, be- I struggle to believe I can do. Listen here. No one paints this picture, and I'm going to paint this picture for you. God is the greatest cheerleader. Everyone has this idea that we are like, God, I'm trying to win your approval. When God is a parent, listen here. When a parent goes to his child game, he's there not so if the son hit the shot, he could become his son. He shows up simply because you already is my son. And when you hit the shot, I celebrate you. But when you lose that game and you cry, I don't kick you out on the street. I bring you home. I ask your heart, what's going on? Why? Because how you performed do not change how I love. But listen here. I don't know about you, but when your dad and your parents show up, you'd be like, oh, I'm about to show out. Why? Because I want to do it for them. Because they gave me this opportunity to do it. Right? That's what we're talking about with this love. Some days I just be like, God, I'm about to do it. Why? He'd be like, he'd be like, he'd be like Jesse, you don't got to trust, trust me. Because you have done so much for me. I don't mind giving it to others. I don't mind sacrificing for others. I don't mind sacrificing my life. Why? Because I know how much you love me, and I know that whatever I give, you can give it back to me if you desire it. So my faith is in you. My hope is in you. My life is hidden in you. So, we need to know love to show love. I want to pray. I want to pray that as we're getting ready to start our week and we're getting it in, listen here, love, love is hard. People are challenging. People are challenging. You know what I'm saying? I like read the story about Moses and you're hitting the rock. I fully understand. Like hard head vipers. You know what I'm saying? I understand. I mean like, oh, Moses, I understand. I, and in those moments, I said, God, how could a person who's seen the glory of God at the highest ever, be frustrated with people. Because he was not Jesus. He didn't have the opportunity that we have to have Christ living in his heart. That in the frustration, he can say, Christ, though they've made false accusations against you, you said not a word, Listen, the glory of God is when you're able to hold your tongue. I got the reason to say it. I'm justified to let you have one. And Christ says, speak not a word. Because I am the vindicator of your character. Listen here. When you know the love of God, you go up and down through life, and you got questions. What's going on? Why? I don't understand it. But the thing that keeps you is the love of Christ. It's perfect love. So that's my prayer, is that as we're starting our week, and we're going to meet challenging people. Might be, get, might be going over someone's house right now, and you're going to meet somebody challenging, Right? But my prayer is for you, that when that challenge comes, you say, God, this is an opportunity for you to be amplified in my life. This is an opportunity so that I can grow more in understanding what the love of Christ looks like. So I want to pray that as we get ready to dismiss. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for your love. God, we... We actually thank you that when we were drifting, lost, talking foolishness, chasing foolishness, you, the God of the universe, you're the one who spoke things into existence, chose to leave your throne, come down to earth. 
and die for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to walk in this love, to walk in this life, to live a life that's dedicated to you so that you might get glory for us now and forever. God, we thank you. God, I'm going to pray for my brothers and sisters, God. Just like Paul prayed. God, I pray, God, that you confirm and strengthen them with your love. That you increase them with your richness and glory. So that they might be strengthened in their inner being. And when everything is falling off inside of them, there's some strength inside of them that you might be rooted and grounded in their heart by love. That, that no matter how many questions that they have, they comprehend with all things. This love that surpasses their understanding. This is our prayer, God. We want your heart in our hearts. We ask you to pray the same prayer that David prayed. God, give me a new heart. Because, God, our desire is you. God, we repent of the things where we fail. We actually repent when we found ourselves drifting off. Not really understanding the magnitude of your love. But, God, we thank you. Just like the prodigal son, he was there waiting for us to come back. Not only that, you ran to us with your arms wide open because you wanted to show us what love looks like. You're not mad. You never was. And God, we thank you for that. So God, when you challenge us to go out here in love, let us remember where we came from. Let us remember where we have fallen and how you restored us. Give us the power and the strength to forgive those who have hurt us, who have abused us, who have ran our name in the mud, who have took advantage of our niceness and our kindness and everything inside of us is hurting right now. And you're asking us to love again. God, we ask you to increase our hearts to give us the strength to do it. Not because we want to do it, but because you asked. Keep our hearts tethered to your heart. Send us to the people that you called us to evangelize to. Send us to the places where you want to get glory and glory alone. God, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the second chance. Thank you for the third chance. Man, I'm preaching for myself, God. Thank you for the, the thousand and twenty-five chance. Thank you for always giving me another shot at it. So God, we surrender our hearts right now to use us, lead us, and guide us for your glory alone. In Jesus Christ's beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. If, if anybody wants prayer, I'm up here to pray. But uh, if not, have a blessed week, and I hope to see y'all next week. God bless.